Good Sunday morning, everyone, and welcome to Hope and Passion Ministries Sunday morning broadcast. This is quite the message for you today. The title of the message is From Pharaoh to the Beast, Victory in Jesus. Hallelujah. From Pharaoh, way back in history, to the coming beast or antichrist, and everywhere in between, and for every person in between, there is only victory in Jesus Christ. You are going to really enjoy this message as we tie the Bible together from beginning to end and see that Jesus Christ is the theme and that our hope for spiritual victory, our hope for making it through this world and into the next with God is found in Jesus Christ. So thank you for joining us today. I'm Shelley Prindle and I am thankful, very grateful to be able to be sharing the word of God with you this morning. Just a reminder that Hope and Passion Ministries, through God's goodness, through his grace, we depend on your donations to exist as a ministry. So please pray about giving. If you are fed by Hope and Passion Ministries, if the Lord blesses you, you really should pray about giving to Hope and Passion to help support us. You can go to hopeandpassion.org to easily give. You can also search Hope and Passion Ministries on Venmo to give that way. We are going to pray after I read the main text for this morning, and then we are going to dive into God's Word and allow the Holy Spirit to meet us right where we are. Now this is exciting stuff because we're going to begin in the book of Revelation. We're going to bounce backward to Exodus but we're going to begin in the book of Revelation chapter 15. And here is what I'd like to read. Revelation 15 verses 2 through 4. Here's what the Bible says. The Apostle John, having been given this revelation from God, says, I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands and they sing the song of Moses the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, the world's only Savior, the world's only hope, precious Jesus who shed his blood for our sin. We come to you in his name. And Lord, I know that there are many people like me who need to know that there is victory in Jesus for every spiritual and emotional battle that we face in this life. God, we come this morning and we ask your Holy Spirit to meet us where we are. I pray that your Holy Spirit would light up the word of God for us today. The same Holy Spirit who inspired the writers of this Bible is the one who illuminates the truth to us this morning. And we're depending on you, God. Do mighty things, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So Revelation chapter 15, where we're going to begin, just so you understand the context and the setting. Revelation 15 puts us on the precipice of the seven bowls of God's wrath. 
Now, if you've been watching the Revelation series with me, you might know this. If you don't, let's give a refresher. But the book of Revelation, as it covers the tribulation period, tells us of three series of judgments. Begins with the seven seal judgments. Then toward the middle of the tribulation, we have the seven trumpet judgments. And then at the very end of the tribulation period, we have the seven bowl judgments. And in Revelation 15, God is kind of giving us a reprieve or an interlude between the seven trumpet judgments and the seven vial or bowl judgments. God kind of gives us something to refresh our hearts, to remind us of the good that he is accomplishing in the middle of all this judgment. And so John catches a vision. His heart is taken from what is happening on earth and all the horrors of the tribulation. His heart is taken from there and it is lifted up to heaven. Where this is what John sees. I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. Now, let's start there. When we think about the sea or the oceans here on this earth, they are tumultuous, right? The sea is always changing. You have the waves, the tide always rolling in. And what a lot of people don't understand is as big and vast as the ocean is to us, and I think uh, statistics tell us that even today, as of 2021, we human beings have only been able to explore about 10% of what is under the sea. Because it's just so vast, it's just so mysterious. But in ancient times, including Bible times, what you need to really understand is that ancient people saw the sea as something volatile. They saw the sea as something dangerous, something changeable, something that represents the restlessness of this world. And so in the Bible, sea is often used as a metaphor for the restlessness, the rebellion of the heathen nations, for the changeableness of this life. That's why many people get confused when they read the end of Revelation and they hear John say, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I don't believe sea there means that the water was no more. Of course, we know that because flowing from God's throne in heaven is a river, the tree of life on either side of the river. So we know that, that there is water in heaven. I totally believe that there will be aquatic life in the new heaven and new earth. Because why would God create something here to take it away there? That's, that's an issue for another day. But the sea there, I believe, represents the restlessness, the changeableness, the, the mysteriousness of the world as it is today. And so when John sees this sea and these people standing there, the sea is one of glass. It is a crystal sea. It, has, it is stabilized. It is firm. It is set. Who can't wait for the day uh, when we are in the new heaven and new earth and the will of God is set and, and his standards are firm and the restlessness and the mysteriousness and the deadliness of this world and its rebellious sinners is gone, right? You know, back in ancient times, they didn't have satellite systems and, and elaborate compasses and the things that we have today. And so a very dark night that blocked out the star and the moon could cause people to be lost at sea. So John says, I see a sea in heaven, but it's a sea of glass. God has everything under control. I believe that's one of the reasons that Jesus walked on water. To demonstrate that under his feet, amen, everything comes into order. Hallelujah. And so John 
sees this, what appears to be a sea of glass and it's mingled with fire. Fire in the Bible always represents the judgment of God. Whether it's the, the hand of God in a Christian life, disciplining us and making us more like Jesus, or the fire of judgment, the hell fire itself. But this shows that God is now in control. His will is set. A sea of glass is mingled with fire. But here's what I want you to see. And also, John saw, when he saw this sea of glass, I also saw those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands, and they're singing. Now, this is incredible because, you know, the one thing that people are always asking me on TikTok is, can anybody be saved during the tribulation? Now, if you're left behind, can you still be saved during the tribulation? But I want to tell you, the tribulation is going to be a wicked, wicked time. It's going to be a very difficult time. But the Bible does tell us that there will be people that are saved during the tribulation. And as this verse makes completely clear, the only way that people conquer is through Jesus Christ. Amen? John said, I saw a group of people who not only they, they conquered the beast, they also conquered its image, and they conquered the number of its name, and they were now singing in victory. Can you imagine? You know, the time that this happens, the time when the beast comes to power, is the second three and a half years of the tribulation. And Jesus in Matthew 24 specifically tells us that the second half, the last three and a half years of the tribulation, that is the great tribulation. Jesus said the world has never seen trouble such as that and never will again. This is the last three and a half years that Satan has to try to destroy God's people and God's plan. He, he'll hold out no stops here. And yet the Bible tells us that even in that horrific time of persecution, when people not only have to conquer the beast, but they have to refuse to worship the image of the beast, which will be set up in the newly built temple in Jerusalem. Remember, Antichrist during the first three and a half years of the tribulation will pretend to be a man of peace. He'll barter a peace treaty with Israel that will allow the Jews to begin their sacrificial system, Old Testament sacrifices, again in Jerusalem. He will seem to allow the world religions to thrive, but then halfway through, he is going to break that peace treaty. His right-hand man, his false prophet, is going to perform signs and wonders. Antichrist is going to appear to be mortally wounded. He's going to imitate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to pretend to be raised from the dead, and then set an image of himself in that temple. And at that point, that is when Antichrist is going to demand to be worshipped. That is when Satan says, I'm going to have my day now. I'm inhabiting this man, the Antichrist, and the world will worship me. And that is when people will be forced not only to conquer the beast, but its image that is set up in the temple. Because under pain of death, you will be told to worship that image, just like in the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And not only that, but you will have to conquer the number of the beast's name, the mark of the beast. You will not be able to buy or sell. You won't be able to feed yourself or feed your family without that mark. And so these people who conquer, it's, it's wonderful that they conquer and they're eternally secure. But know this, their time of conquering on the earth came with a price. No doubt they were martyred for the name of Jesus. No doubt before their martyrdom, they were on the run. They were in hiding. They were scavenging for food. Think about that. But the Bible says they conquered. You know, this will be a day when people will have to give their lives for belief in Jesus Christ. And many even in our world today are. We close our eyes to it and aren't aware, but many even in our world today are giving their lives for the name of Jesus. But I'm here to tell you something. Jesus said, whosoever would come after me must take up his cross daily and follow me must die to him or herself daily and follow me. 
We are called to conquer. We are called to live for Jesus in every moment, to yield whatever we have to yield for his purposes. But these people, during the time of the great tribulation, the culmination of God's judgment here, they conquer the beast, its image, and the number of its name. And they're standing there and they're singing. And here's what I want you to see. In verse 3, the Bible says, They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb with a capital L. Now, I agree with many Bible scholars who say this song is one in the same. The song of Moses is the song of the Lamb, Jesus. How many of you know that all the men and women of the Old Testament who were saved looked forward to Jesus Christ? They believed in the coming Messiah. And so did Moses. And these people who conquered the beast are standing and singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. When I read that, I thought to myself, they're singing the song of Moses. These people are at the crescendo of God's tribulation. They're at the worst part of human history. God's judgment. They're under the reign of the Antichrist. They've been, they're being martyred for his name and they're conquering. And they are singing the song of Moses. The song from more than 3,500 years from where we are today backwards, they're singing that song. Wow. The Bible is completely tied together. And it intrigued me to think that people who survived the tribulation, not survived the tribulation, but conquered during the tribulation, most likely through death, are singing the song of Moses. So what is that song? Right? It behooves us to ask the question, what is that song? It must be a very important song. If those who conquer the beast during the great tribulation in Jesus' name are singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. So I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and go back to the book of Exodus with me for just a minute and remember something, a little bit of quick review. Remember, if you would, that God's chosen people, the Israelites... By the way, that's who the whole tribulation period is about anyway. Bringing this, the Jews, bringing the Israelites back to Jesus Christ. If you remember, the Israelites found themselves as slaves to the Egyptians through a set of circumstances. And for over 400 years, they served the Egyptians in cruel labor. They were used and abused. And it's critical for you to understand this message and, and to understand what's happening in Exodus. That God's chosen people, the Israelites, being enslaved to Egypt is a picture, a type, or a foreshadowing of every single human being who is unsaved. We are slaves to sin, the Bible says. You read the book of Romans, you'll find that out. When you don't have Jesus Christ, read Romans, read Galatians, you are a slave to sin. The devil uses you and abuses you. And those Israelites were stuck in Egypt and, and every child that was born had no hope of ever any other life but working for the Egyptians and not gaining anything for it except to be beaten, to be half starved, to be overworked. And all the fruit of their labor to go to the enemy. And that's how it is when you're unsaved. But when God delivers his people out of Egypt and takes them to the promised land, that's a picture of salvation and spiritual victory. Amen? So we go back and we remember that because we know that these martyrs of the tribulation sing the song of Moses. So there must be something for us to gain there. Hallelujah. So in the book of Exodus, we remember that in chapter 2, verse 23, the Bible says at first when the Israelites were in Egypt, they, they were given favorable treatment because Joseph had moved up in the ranks of Egypt. And the Pharaoh liked Joseph, the Israelites, so he gave them favor. But 
During those many days, the king of Egypt died. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help when a new Pharaoh came. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. That's what I want you to hear this morning. Maybe you're still stuck in sin. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior yet. Maybe you feel enslaved to sinful nature and tendencies. I want you to know that the first move that's got to be made is just cry out to God. The Bible says when they cried out to God that God heard, God remembered his covenant. God saw the people who were crying out to him and God knew. Nobody else may understand your cry, but God hears your cry and God knows. And that set into motion the plan of God. God calls Moses to go to the Pharaoh. And you know how the history of this goes. God sent 10 plagues. I can't even believe that the first nine didn't work. I don't know how many out there agree with me that if God sent a plague of locusts and there were locusts or there were frogs, he sent a plague of frogs crawling in my bed and all over everything. Okay, that would do it for me. If I were Pharaoh, I'd say, get these people out of here. But in God's providence, none of those plagues, the gnats, the locusts, the boils, the darkness, none of those plagues worked. Except for the last one, the 10th plague. And who remembers what plague it was that finally set the Israelites free? Do you remember? The plague of the death of the firstborn. Every firstborn man and animal in Egypt was to die on a particular night. And I want you to know something. That in God's providence, that is a beautiful foreshadowing of the only hope we have. To get out of sin and to get out of the wages of sin, which is death. Do you know the only thing that can slay death? The only thing that can kill death is death. The death of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The only thing that can stop a human being from the spiritual downfall and death that we are in is the death of the God-man, Jesus Christ. The only thing that can cure the spiritual death and the physical death, the eternal dying of a human being, of a man, is the God-man, the one without sin, who died in our place to pay the price for sin's penalty. Hallelujah. And so God was showing the Israelites that night that death would kill death. And here's what I mean. When God was going to send the death angel to kill the firstborn man and animal in every household, God said this to the Israelites. And we read it very clearly in Exodus 12, 12 and 13. Listen to this. God said very clearly, I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt that night and I'll strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. But the blood, here's what he said to the Israelites, but the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I, God, see the blood over your house, I will pass over you and no plague shall befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So the death of the firstborn is what would finally get Pharaoh to tell the Israelites, get out of here. But God said to his people, if you want to stop the death angel from coming into your house, you've got to kill a lamb. A lamb without defect, without blemish. Because that lamb is going to represent Jesus Christ, the one with no sin. You need to take a lamb without defect and you need to cut its throat. You need to kill that lamb. That represents the death of Jesus. But then you need to take the blood from that lamb and you must paint it over your doorposts with the hyssop branch. That will be the mark, God says, that I will see. And that will differentiate you from the unbelieving Egyptians and I think that's beautiful because it's also a picture of what God is saying. You know, when you get saved, yes, it is, first of all, a matter of the heart. 
But it is also a matter of you differentiating yourself from the dying world and saying, I do believe in Jesus Christ. I'm willing to paint his blood, as it were, over my heart. I'm willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the one, hallelujah, who's saving me from death. Praise God. And by the blood of that lamb, just as by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are saved by the blood of that lamb on the doorpost. When the death angel came through Egypt on that night, when he came to the houses of the Israelites, the death angel passed over. Praise God. And if the blood of Jesus is over your heart, the death angel is going to pass over you. When the time of physical death happens, your body will expire. But your spirit will go to be with Jesus forever. And you'll get your body back. You'll get your body back at the rapture of the church. Well, we want to get back to this song of Moses. But you need to understand how God got the Israelites out of Egypt through that plague. Pharaoh said, go ahead and go. When his own son died, when this terrible plague of death came, and he obviously was not protected, didn't obey the Lord's command, Israelite, the Israelites were set free. Now, you got to know something. Just because you get saved, that does not mean the devil is going to quit fooling around with you. As a matter of fact, because you get saved, because you start having an impact on the kingdom of darkness, because you start living for Jesus, because people are taking note of the blood of Jesus Christ working powerfully in your life, precisely because of that, the enemy will come after you. He still wants to destroy you. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And this morning, I know there's some people listening, and the enemy's coming hard after you, and you feel like you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Listen to me. This is where the Song of Moses comes into play. The same song that the martyrs of the tribulation were able to sing when they conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. See, because God told the Israelites, go. Pharaoh said, go. And they went. And God led them to leave in his particular way. He told them the route to take and how to go. And in God's providence, the Israelites end up at the shore of the Red Sea. They're smack up against the Red Sea. Following what God told them to do. But in Exodus chapter 14 verse 5. Having just let the Israelites go. The Bible says when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled. The mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said what is this we've done that we've let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot, took his army with him, took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued the people while they were going out defiantly. I want to tell you something. Pharaoh let the people go under the hand of God, but then he thought to himself, what did I just do? I let all my free slave labor right out the window. I'm coming after them again. And I want to tell you something. When you get saved by the blood of Jesus, the enemy knows he suffered a loss. Can I get an amen? The enemy knows he has suffered a loss. He doesn't like that. He's going to try to chase you down. He wants you to hear the hoofbeats of his chariots, of his horses. He wants you to fear. And that's exactly what this is a picture of. Pharaoh is a type of Satan. And he's coming after God's people. And I got to tell you something. The Israelites, even though they had seen all the mighty miracles of the ten plagues, 
even though they had every reason to believe in the God of incredible miracles who saved them. There was nothing they could have done to deliver themselves, and yet here they are delivered. Those very people, just like we do, when they heard the hoofbeats, when they looked back and saw Pharaoh chasing them and coming after them, they feared greatly. And they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us out here into the wilderness? And all of a sudden, these people who've been delivered by the mighty hand of God are assuming that God set them free just to kill them. And do we ever accuse God of such things? Do we ever say, God, things have gotten so hard, it's gotten so tough since I've come to know you? The enemy's been chasing me so hard since I come to know you. Did you really? Did you really just save me to destroy me? And we know the answer is no. But there are times when you feel that, when you feel the hoof beats after you. The ground is pulsing. And the enemy wants you to fear. I want you to know what happens here. God gives Moses instructions. Tells them, I'm going to take you through the Red Sea. I'm going to take you all straight through the Red Sea. And then Pharaoh's going to try to follow you. So, before I read the next scripture, I want you to know, and you might remember this, that when God took the Israelites out of Egypt and to the promised land, he led them by the angel of the Lord, which many believe, as I do, this is the pre-incarnate, before he came in the flesh, Jesus Christ. God led his people with the pillar of cloud by day, and it was a pillar of fire by night. So that in the day they could follow the Lord, and in the night they could follow the Lord. It was his manifest, special Shekinah glory, his presence. I believe it was the pre-incarnate, Jesus Christ, in a cloud by day and fire by night, leading the people out in front of them. And here's the glorious thing. When Pharaoh came after them from behind, listen to what the Bible says, Exodus 14, 19. Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and stood behind them coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel bringing light to the Israelites and darkness to the Egyptians think about that the pre-incarnate Christ God himself he was leading his people out front but when the enemy came from behind, what did Jesus do? Jesus moved from in front of his people and came and graciously and humbly moved behind his people, praise God, to become the rear guard. I want to tell you something with all my heart this morning. God's got your back. If you have given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have asked Jesus to save you and cleanse you by his blood, God's got your back. Isn't that ultimately what Jesus did? He left the glory of heaven and came to this earth. He humbled himself. And that is what he does here. He moves behind and becomes their rear guard. And Moses stretches out his hand over the sea. And listen to what the Bible says. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land so that the waters were divided in two. And the wind, of course, represents the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in verse 22 of Exodus 14, the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground Listen to this, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and a wall on their left. And again, that is a beautiful picture of the holiness of how the true Christian is to walk in a separate way from the world. We must walk the only way 
the way of Jesus. We must walk the narrow path. Amen? If those Israelites would have wandered far too much to the left or to the right, they would have been in the waters. They would have drowned as well. But they had to walk in the dry land with the wall of water on their left and right down the narrow way. And as they did, God got them through to the other side. Now the Egyptians came in after them. The Egyptians saw the, the path open and they thought, oh, well, we'll take that path too. It's interesting because that reminds me of the fact that there are many people who appear to be going the Christian way. There are many people who appear or may say the name of Jesus or may even attend church. They may even be teachers and preachers and they appear to be taking the same way. But God knows the motive of their hearts. Amen? The motive of the Israelites' hearts was we want to get to where our God wants us to go. We're humbly trusting him. We're humbly believing him. Pharaoh's motive was to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Pharaoh went down that same narrow way, but he was destroyed by it. And the Israelites were saved by it. Praise God. There are many false teachers. The motive of their heart is completely wrong. And Jesus said, you can do miracles and cast out demons in my name and all that stuff. But in the end, I'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Wow. So the Egyptians came in after the Israelites. But in verse 26, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea and the water will come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. After the Israelites were totally through, Moses looked back over that sea, stretched out his hand, and the waters that had been a wall on the left and the right started coming in. And as the Egyptians were walking in that same way, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. Praise God. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea. The waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. God destroyed every Egyptian. In the very same path by which he saved his people, he destroyed the enemy. And I love, I love verse 30. And maybe you want to circle Exodus 14, 30 in your Bible. Because this is going to happen to us one day. The Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. The Bible says in Romans 16, 20, that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. I love that God's going to let us take part in the victory, that we will help trample Satan, that we will see with our own eyes the enemy be taken out. Praise God. It is a fact. It is a truth. And he will be destroyed. And the Israelites physically saw the Egyptians drown and looked at them dead on the seashore. And my friends, that is where we begin to read this glorious song of Moses. This is the most ancient song recorded in the Bible. Moses sings this song and we know in the book of Revelation that the martyrs of the tribulation who've conquered the beast, the Israelites have conquered Pharaoh, and the martyrs of the tribulation who will conquer the beast sing this same song. You say, Shelly, how could the song be sung so many millennia apart? Because from then until now, until the future tribulation, there is still only one song to sing. 
Can I get an amen out there? There's only one song to sing, and that is the song that says victory in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You know, you talk about history. The devil couldn't keep Jesus in the tomb. If ever the powers of hell wanted to keep somebody in the grave, it was, it was when Jesus was in the tomb. When the devil couldn't keep him there and Jesus resurrected, I believe that now the devil's focus is, well, he's alive. He's at the right hand of the Father and he's promised to come back. And since he's promised to come back and that's what the people of God are supposed to be looking for, I think I'll try to disrupt that whole process by faking to be him, the Antichrist. See that? And that's why you have this whole beast thing at the end of time. But Satan never could beat God and he never will beat God. Amen. And he can't, Satan cannot beat you if you are a child of God. So we need to sing the song of Moses, which is the song of the martyrs of the tribulation. And it should be our song right here today. So I want you this week to peruse and to then carefully read through Exodus chapter 15. I'm going to take a few verses out of this song to close this message which to show you what it was that this song is. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. What a victorious statement. Lord, we trusted you. Lord, we applied the blood to the houses where we lived. Lord, you, you took care of death on our behalf. You set us from bondage to slavery. You put us on the path to victory. And when the enemy tried to chase us down, you destroyed the enemy. Can you sing that song today? Can you get down on your knees or lift your hands to God and sing the song of Moses or pray the song of Moses out loud and say to God, you have triumphed gloriously. You did everything you promised you would do. You defeated the enemy. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become today my actual salvation. He spared my life. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God. I will exalt him. Verse 3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Most people don't know what to do with verses like that. When most people think of Jesus, they think of just some nice guy. No, the definition of Jesus is not a nice guy. Jesus is love and he's kind, but he is above all God. He is above all holy. He is above all righteous. And righteous God must make war on sin and sinners ultimately. And what would destroy his people? He declares war. And so the song of Moses includes this line. The Lord is a man of war. He's a warrior. You say, Shelly, but that's not, that's not true of Jesus. I mean, in the book of Revelation, is that even in the, after, you know, Jesus came to earth, is God a man of war? Well, have you ever read Revelation chapter 19, the battle of Armageddon? At the end of the tribulation, when Jesus comes back to fight the battle of Armageddon against the armies of the world, and I believe we will be with him, having been raptured and with him for seven years, we'll come back for this battle. Did you ever read? Jesus fighting the battle of Armageddon, Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful with a capital F and True with a capital T. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Yeah. The Jesus who died on the cross for our sins is the Jesus who is coming back to make war on all those who reject his sacrifice. Reject him. He judges and makes war. There can't be a world that is right. With the God ruling the world that is right. There can't be a world where God does not allow wrong. Unless he makes war on wrong and sin. Hallelujah. So from the time of the song of Moses. 
to the tribulation martyrs singing it. God is a, a God of war. He makes war on sin. He makes war on those who are in rebellion against him. Because he is going to make the world right. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea. His chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. Listen to this, verse 9. The enemy said, I'm going to pursue those people. I'm going to overtake them. I'm going to divide the spoil. I'm going to get what I want. I'm going to draw my sword. My hand will destroy them. That's what the devil's trying to say about you. Hey, she or he just came to Jesus. They're doing damage to my kingdom of darkness. I'm going to go after them. I'm going to get what I want from them. I'm going to destroy them. You know what the next verse says in 10? God, you blew with your wind. The Holy Spirit came. You blew with your wind. The sea covered the enemy. And they sank like lead in the waters. My friends, there is a day coming. There is a day coming. Paul talks about it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Where Jesus is going to take down the Antichrist. He's going to take down Satan. When he takes down the Antichrist, the Bible says he's going to do it by just the splendor of his coming and the breath of his mouth. He's going to destroy the Antichrist with nothing more than the breath of his mouth. And in this moment right now, whatever the enemy is trying to do to your life, I want you to picture this. God can blow the power of his Holy Spirit and bring the plans of the enemy to nothing. On your behalf. Hallelujah. Who's going to receive that today? Skip down to verse 13. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You paid for us. You bought us. You got it out. Now you're leading us. You got us out. You're leading us. You have guided us by your strength to your holy abode. In other words, they were on their way to the promised land, but ultimately this is fulfilled in the fact that God is going to take us to heaven one day. Then, this is part of the song of Moses. Moses says, the peoples that live all around here, they heard and they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom are dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab and all the inhabitants of Canaan, they've melted away in fear. Listen, Moses said, terror and dread have fallen upon the enemies all around because of the greatness of your arm, God. All of the surrounding peoples are still as a stone. I love this verse. You ready? All of the surrounding peoples, all the Canaanites, all the ones that would go to war against us, they are as still as a stone till your people, O oh Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. I want you to think about that very intensely for a minute. If you have allowed God to purchase you by the blood of Jesus Christ, here's what the Bible promises. All of the enemy, all of the surrounding nations, all of those who would try to take you down, they will be stopped. They will become as still as a stone until God brings us through and we pass by and get to where he's taking us. Praise God. Do you know where he's taking you? He's taking you to the holy mountain. He's taking you to Mount Jerusalem. He's taking you to the new heaven and new earth. Hallelujah. 
You will bring them in and plant them on your mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. And the Lord will reign forever and ever. Praise God. Until we pass by, until we pass through this broken world, this world that is going to bring so much against us, Lord, the enemy will be as still as a stone. They'll be there, but they will be, in a sense, ineffective against the people that God has purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 19. This is the end of the Song of Moses, verses 19 through 21. Ready? When the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, Moses' sister, Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron took a tambourine in her hand and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. Can you see the beauty of this? The basic principles, the basic truths that Moses and the Israelites and Miriam were able to sing and dance to and celebrate that wonderful song. Every basic truth of that song applies to you and I today and ultimately even applies during that most horrible time called the Great Tribulation. Where people will conquer the beast and its image and the number of its name. And they too will sing the song of Moses. And now we know what the song of Moses is. Lord, you've purchased us by your blood. You have taken down death on our behalf by the death of Jesus Christ. And as we are willing to publicly apply that blood to our hearts. As we allow you to buy us back from slavery. You will get us out. And yes, the enemy will chase us down. But God, you will triumph. You will do away with the enemy. You will keep the enemy at bay until we pass by, until we get through. And you take us to your home. Praise God. And one day the promise of revelation is the very presence of God, the very throne of God, the very home of God is going to descend onto a newly remade earth and heaven. This whole sky and outer space and this earth will be remade and God will bring down his presence from wherever he is and put it here. And he will dwell with us. And we will be his people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The song of Moses is a song of victory in Jesus. The people that God has purchased. God is going to take care of. God will destroy the work of the enemy and ultimately destroy the enemy. Hallelujah. I believe the Holy Spirit has touched some of you today. I believe there are some of you out there that need to sing the song of Moses. I'm praying that you will reread Exodus 15 and Revelation 15. That you will know that from the time of Pharaoh to the time of the beast and every moment in between, there is victory in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I'm going to ask you, Father, be gracious to us, I pray, as I know you always are willing to do. And if there is anyone who has heard these words and needs to call upon you as Savior, if there is anyone who needs to be purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ 
anyone who needs to be set free from slavery to sin, Lord, do it this morning. I pray that they call upon you now and that they sense the mighty working of your Holy Spirit coming through their heart even now to save. And for every Christian who's hearing the hoofbeats, the enemy's chariots, oh, may they sing the song of Moses. May they remember that even though the enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy, Jesus Christ has come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And that God, you triumph always over the enemy's work in our lives. Lord, help us to have the tenacious faith of even the martyrs of the tribulation who will conquer the beast and conquer the image and conquer the number of its name through Jesus Christ our Savior. May we be able to do the same in the days in which we live. And we thank you, Lord. Amen. It's been a powerful message this morning. I sense that the Holy Spirit has worked mightily. I want to ask God to give his greatest blessings to you as you call upon Jesus Christ. And I also ask that you keep hope and passion ministries in your prayers. And please ask the Lord if he would have you to be a part of supporting us financially that we can continue to declare God's holy word. Have a blessed week in Jesus Christ. Amen.